Felix here, and happy Friday to you. Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? You're clinging on for dear life, one arm out of the window or on the ledge. That's what's about to happen this morning. <laughs> Unemployment numbers out. It won't be quite as bad as that. But yeah, it's, it's a big one. If we see a substantial improvement, and by improvement, I mean substantially more people unemployed in this um, morally moribund world that we live in as investors, then the markets will breathe a sigh of relief. If, inflation, if unemployment is still pretty low, which is what I would expect it to be, we saw very moderate improvement yesterday, then the Fed's going to proceed, with, which is what it was threatening to do yesterday with, uh, with Bullard and, and was a Wallace speaking yesterday. Basically, we're going to get to 35 3.75% is kind of where I'm pointing it now for the end of the year, of, of, which is obviously huge, it's 2% more than we have right now in, in Fed target rate. So that's what we're kind of gagging for here. Super important stuff. Thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in. Um, Andre, you think the impact of these numbers is overstated, and you're saying everything is in... You know, with investing, everything is kind of an opinion, isn't it? I mean, yeah, they're facts. They're definitely hard facts. I mean, look at something like like this here. Of course, none of this is financial advice. You know that by now. Um, you know, I've got gross margin. That's a hard fact. I've got returns on equity. That's a moderately hard fact. I've got stuff like debt over equity. That's a hard fact. You can't really mess with that. You've got long-term sales growth. That's a hard fact. Those things are facts. But then, of course, you have to interpret them in the sense of where do you draw the line, right? What do you, where do you draw the line of what is a good company, what's a bad company? And, um, and that's kind of your job as an investor, really, to do that. So get your hands on this clever little sheet. Put your tickets into it and press the, the update button and marvelously... It pulls up all of the data for you. And, and you can obviously do that every quarter as the data gets updated, and then you know exactly what you own. So I highly recommend you do that. Uh, you can do that via felixfencer.org slash Patreon down below. It's like 20 cents a day or something. At least join it for the month and like just use the ticker. Go through your portfolio, understand what you own, and, and, and be an informed investor rather than a not really sure. Like, what's the average gross margin of your portfolio? Do you not know that? You should really know that. And it's not a trick question. I'm not trying to be like facetious. I'm just saying this is really something that we, we need to know as investors. Otherwise, we're just like buying stuff blindly. If your buddy came to you and said, hey, will you invest in my business and give me $100,000? You would ask him questions like, what are your margins? How much are you making? Who are your customers? You know, who's your competition? Uh, show me your numbers for the last couple of years. What do you think is going to happen in the next couple of years? That sort of thing. You've got to do the same thing with stocks. So thanks for, for the inspiration, uh, Andre. Appreciate that. Um, brilliant. Uh, so yeah, we just we started here a couple, a couple of minutes late. You didn't join anything, miss anything, Andrea. We're basically hanging here, literally going, what are the numbers? Knuckles are white. Uh, that's what we're waiting for. Uh, the market in the meantime is moderately cautious. The Nasdaq particularly very cautious because higher interest rates hurt tech stocks the most. Why? Very, very simple. Uh, well, actually, not that simple, not that logical either to the sort of normal mind. Um, if you spend too much time with investing people, bankers and so on, you'll understand this a little bit better. Basically, a growth stock is valued at, say, five year forward. So the next five years forward profits. But you are, here is now. So what we have to do, we have to take the profit in five years and we have to work it back into today's money because there is a little thing called inflation and the opportunity cost and so on. And that's what we call basically discounting it back or um, you know, getting it back to present value. That's what, what now is so present value. And the higher inflation is, the higher interest rates are, the bigger this discount gets, and therefore the value of those stocks falls. So good rule of thumb is 1% higher interest rate means 9% lower stock price. Now this applies to companies that have all of, well, that are basically growth companies. So where we expect most of the money is yet to come. I'm not talking about Boeing or something here. Now, to what extent is this priced in? Well, what we see here, here from the market, these are, hang on, 
These are the Fed fund futures. And if you want to invest in that sort of madness, up here are the tickers. The market is at the moment pricing in a year end of 325 to 3.5% interest. Now, with what we just heard Wallace and Bullard say, and I think what the general feeling seems to be, we're going to get 0.75% in July. I think that's a done deal. I think in September, we're probably going to get another 0.75% unless the data really improves before then. I'm kind of cautious on that. So that would take us to 3.25%, and then you get two more quarter percentage point rate hikes, uh, which take us to 3.5 and then to 3.75. So I actually think we're going to go higher than the market expects. So that's a quarter of a percentage point. So by that logic, you should be losing about another 2%, 3% maybe off, off the, uh, uh, say, you know, growth tech companies value. Now, could it be slightly different? Yeah, it could be 0.5% in September and then another 0.5% in, in November, but it'll it'll come out with the same numbers at the end of the day. That's sort of the way, the way I see it. And can you make money out of that? Yep, you absolutely can. Uh, take this lovely cycle of market emotions and, oh my God, the data is out. Let's look at it. I haven't been this excited since, I don't know, one, when the, the last bit of ice cream. So here we go. Let's look at the data. Let's look at what we've got here. Righty ho. We were expecting, ooh, we were expecting non-farm payroll to come in with 300,000 jobs. We got 372,000. Okay, so from a, I'm going to make this a NASDAQ score. Okay, so sort of a growth score. This is terrible. Far too many jobs. Far too many jobs for the market for the Fed to go, okay, things are changing. Unemployment rate came in exactly as expected. So that's sort of neither here nor there. It's basically, it's basically negative because you needed unemployment to go up and it is just not moving. Average hourly earnings, okay, that's a slight positive because make that a little bit bigger. Of a, why are my pluses so wonky today? Um, that's a small plus because it's a, such a small difference. Expectation was 5.2% coming at 5.1%. It's a little bit of a drop from the last month. So wage growth is moderating, but it's still very, very high, really very high. Month on month, um, that's, a, that's a positive here, really. That's the 0.3% increase. We were expecting 04 So that's good, actually, right? That's quite a nice drop there. Participation rate. That's also not good. It's fallen again. So the Fed desperately wants more people to return to work. Their the expectation was that after COVID, everybody would be like, okay, well, the world's a safe place again. I can't wait to drive 90 minutes and sit in a gray cubicle and do boring, tedious work. That's what I live for. That's why I get out of bed in the morning. That's what they thought people would do. And they haven't. And I have to say, I'm, I'm impressed with people who haven't done that. Get out of the corporate um, rat race. It isn't very much fun. Now, manufacturing payrolls, we were expecting 21,000 jobs manufacturing. We got 29,000. That's a strong labor market in manufacturing. Manufacturing is the one part of the economy where we've had really very bad, worrisome data with manufacturing expectations having declined drastically the last month. So that's a big negative again for growth stocks. Government payrolls, well, that's something the government can control. So that's a positive. The government's laying people off, which is probably a good thing, not for the people getting laid off, but just generally for the size of the government. Non-farm payrolls, we're expecting, as so this is private, uh, this, uh, this up here is, private and public. So this is this is private and public, as in public government. And then this is just private. We were expecting 290,000 jobs. We got 381,000 jobs. That's more than last month. So this is just terrible. It's just terrible. From a tech investor point of view, I'm not saying people should not have jobs. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, interpreting it this way. So the average weekly hours work doesn't make it make much of a difference. It's come down a touch. It's sort of like, well, it's summer. Um, so overall, I, I really can't see a big silver lining here. You, you could argue that the average hourly earnings, that's a good thing. It means people are getting perhaps a little bit more concerned about where the economy is heading. So they're asking for slightly lower uh, wage increases. 
that's definitely a positive. But when we look at the negatives and the positives here, we've got you know four times as many negatives as positives. So I don't see the market loving this. Now, the market in the short term tends to be highly erratic. Let's have a look at the QQQ here. It's down one percentage point. Let's have a look at the, the live minute chart. I think it's just collapsed a little because it was up. It wasn't up, but it was just only down 0.3%. Here's the minute chart. Let me make it a bit bigger. So this whole this whole yellow zone from here to the right is pre-market. And look at that drop, right? You see that drop? The market agrees with us, uh, which makes sense. It's just the labor market is incredibly strong. And there we have it. It's climbing up a little, but it's, yeah, it's a big drop. Almost 1% off uh, this, this morning's uh, pre-market. So that's pretty, pretty significant. And John sums it up very nicely. It means the Fed can raise rates more. Absolutely. Expect 0.75% in July. It's a done deal. And I would say also in September. I mean, unless I, I just don't see what would make the jobs market collapse in August and, and, and September before the next meeting then. Because the consumer, the consumers still have money and therefore they will keep spending. And it's summer, people are on holiday and that kind of thing. So you get a lot more uh, jobs in, um, in, you know, restaurants and, and hotels and, and, and the F&B sector and all that kind of stuff, services. There's a lot of temporary jobs that, that pop up in the summer. So generally, employment numbers are pretty good in the summer anyway. So I don't really see the Fed being able to destroy that in a sense. It's recovering a little bit here. You can see the Nasdaq, but yeah, not a good reaction to it, which is exactly what we expected. Um, Let me just see if I missed any questions here. Okay, good morning to everybody. When's the data released? Okay, we just went through it. We'll do a quick recap in a minute for anyone who's missed it. But yes, it's very, very, very strong employment data. We have 72,000 more non-agricultural jobs than we were expecting. That's just staggering. 72,000 over 300, it's a big percentage. Uh, I don't have to tell you that. So that's, you know, 25% or something higher than expected. And the only people who have been laying people off is the government. Uh, and, and quite frankly, they can obviously do their bit to like slow down the economy, although all that stimulus they're starting to throw out again is going to do the opposite. But yeah, this is not going to be good for, for tech this morning. Um, not a disaster either. It's also an opportunity. You are just getting more time to buy good stocks at lower prices. But look at this here. Uh, upstarts down, Twitter, Beyond Meat, SoFi, Coin, everything down more than 2%. Uh, where, where do we go to like the sort of 1% break? Amazon even down 1%. QQQ down, now down 0.75%. And anything up? Yushin, what, 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 what the heck do they do? They're always up every day, 5, 15% or something. Bank of America, why? And JP Morgan, why? Because it means higher interest rates. What, what, what do banks do? If you've got, I don't know how many deposits does JP Morgan have, 750 billion or something insane. If you've got lots of deposits, that isn't your money. That's what banks do, right? And they don't really like you to withdraw it. If you've tried, they usually come up with some sort of technicality why you can't. They get interest from the Fed or from the government, essentially. So what they can do, they can take the deposits, they can buy government debt with it at essentially zero risk because we assume that the US government isn't going to go bust. That's an assumption, but it's a fairly good one. And then they can receive interest for it. So when the interest rates go up by, say, 0.75%, and you've got you know a trillion dollars, you're making a heck of a lot more money. Now, should you pass this on to the consumer whose money it is? Yeah, you should, but you're not going to, are you? <laughs> because that's the basis of your business. So even if you're going to pass it on, you might pass on a quarter of a percentage point here, but you still got 0.75% up there. And that's what we're seeing. And that's what everybody's doing. So there isn't really strong competition for this. Uh, and therefore, it's just money bonanza when interest rates go up for the big banks. So your JP Morgans, your Bank of Americas, they're the ones with the biggest deposits are going to do pretty well. Volatility up a little bit. Baba just peeking into the green zone, and that's pretty much it. That's actually exactly it. Literally everything else is down. If we have a look at the, 
Let's have a look at the heat map for stocks. Pre-market, 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 where is it? Here we go, pre-market S&P. Looks pretty, pretty red, doesn't it? With few exceptions of banks, basically. This whole square here is, is banks. So they're having a good morning. Uh, and, and tech falling down predictably. Amazon down a bit. Tesla down. Now, why are commercial services, why is PayPal or Visa down? Well, if you go into a recession, people tend to just spend more. And that means that they use less payment services. Very, very simple. You're just going to buy less junk you didn't particularly need uh, and you just don't pay with those things so there we are let me see if i missed any questions from you guys uh, any sector benefiting from these numbers yep absolutely banking finance is uh, qqq so, sorry that's the nasdaq etf I, I i shouldn't use acronyms i try not to i apologize um there are no such things as tough questions says shaney um quick question is the S&P trading today? Check the ticker on Google and it's grayed out as yesterday's number. Well, the market isn't open yet. So you have to look at a, at a pre-market. This is all S&P 500 stocks pre-market. So the market opens in about uh, 50 minutes. And so that's when you will get the numbers in Google. And it'll be probably be delayed by 15 minutes on Google as well. JP Morgan's got earnings coming up absolutely next week. I was setting up earnings options trades yesterday. I was looking at finance, financials. I looked at JP Morgan. I couldn't see how to make any good money out of that. So I set up a Wells Fargo trade instead, uh, which isn't particularly bullish. And it makes uh, yeah very nice returns, which is how we continue to make these lovely returns. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? It's glorious. We're up 105% realized returns. This is cash that I got since the beginning of January. So you're going to wait for the next 105% to miss out on until you start learning to become a good options trader. I don't know. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. It's up to you, really. Uh, but do check it out. FelixFence.org slash options. Here it is. That coupon code is 100PC. It stands for 100%. I guess I should change it now to 105%, but I won't. It'll be confusing. So write down the coupon code and check it out. FelixFence.org slash options if you wish to make money. I know some people don't like money. I can't really help you. If you don't like money, I like money. I like money a lot. And what do I do with it? With the gains from this? I reinvest it into stocks. That's what I do with it. Why? Because I like the income stream from stocks. It's just really easy. It's really passive. Like I buy a slice of Microsoft. There are 120,000 people working very, very hard for me. And I have to do absolutely nothing for it. That's why I love it. So I, 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 I like both sides of, of in trading and long-term investing. I think both kind of complement each other. Um, uh, Andrea, yeah, Yahoo Finance is a good site as well for free, free uh, real-time quotes. Um, so the Fed does need to be more, more, more aggressive. Absolutely. That's precisely what this means. The Fed is going to be more aggressive. The Fed is basically... That the whole the whole system by which the Fed tanks inflation is the following: higher rates should lower demand. How do they do that? They do that in various ways. They basically make mortgages more expensive, and you know car loans and that sort of thing. Please don't have a car loan. Just don't buy a bleeding car. Don't have a car loan. Really, like just buy stuff or don't lease it or something, but just don't have a car loan. It's a really bad place to be, I, I think, uh, unless there's a huge tax advantage and you've got the money anyway. In that case, yeah, okay, do it, do it through a company. Uh, what they obviously also do is kind of investment costs. So companies, if they want to buy cap, you know, machinery, factories, that kind of thing, normally they will use finance for that. So they will increase the investment cost and therefore they will re 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 reduce demand. And by reducing demand, well, the effect of that is less jobs. And less jobs means less demand, right? So you're going to get into this cycle. So what the Fed is desperately trying to achieve is to lower demand sufficiently to reduce the number of jobs out there. That's really the only tool that they have. And they are failing miserably, absolutely miserably. The economists, all these smart people with PhDs were predicting 300,000 jobs to be created. Or, yeah, and, and we got 372,000 jobs in June. That's like 
more than 20% higher than expected. So job market is strong, very, very strong, nothing changing here. The only slight sliver of positive news from the cold-hearted investor point of view is hourly earnings month-on-month -month grew only 0.3% versus 0.4% last month. So what does that mean? Well, it still means that annualized, that's still a pretty pretty hefty increase in, in wages, but it's coming down. And it's obviously way below inflation rates. And I don't really believe that that number is going to stick around because if I were a union, I'd be like, you know, picketing right now like they are all across Europe and saying inflation is 10%. I want 15% more money. I mean, go back to the to the early 90s, right? That's what unions were doing then. And um, I hope I'm not giving them any ideas, but you know, that's what I were doing, it would be doing if I were them. Because as an employee, you are earning less every single month because you're only getting 5% more on a yearly basis and inflation is like easily double that, right? So you're getting screwed, which is why generally salaried people do get screwed. You, you're going to want to create some sort of site income that you can actually control. How much do you enjoy um, the $200 options budget? It's a little too little, to be honest with you, to actually start trading options. You need at least a thousand bucks to be able to diversify. Otherwise, you're going to set up very risky. You're only going to be able to set up maybe two or three trades with that, and it's just too risky. You're going to be able to, be able to set up 10 or 15 or 20 trades so that you are more diversified. Robert wants me to turn this into an option stream. Uh, Robert, we can we can do some more on that on the on the live call tomorrow. Uh, Robert's part of my my coaching gr uh, group, uh, so we, we'll 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 do that tomorrow. Robert, uh, essentially, um, look at the movement in the last couple of earnings. That's the, the, the to start with. Uh, look at generally what earnings guidance it has been doing. If it's declining, you might expect lower forward-looking statements. And then if you are more in consumer side of things, you kind of expect lower stuff. On the finance side, I'd always, always be a little bit cautious because you know the traders, the, the big banks, tend to actually make quite a lot of money out of uh, the choppy markets because you know they, they trade options and that sort of thing like we do. Um, but the more, the more kind of mortgage-heavy banks, for example, that's why I did the Wells Fargo trade that you've seen, obviously, Robert, uh, because you know they're laying people off because they're, they're big into mortgages. Uh, but no, I appreciate the question. I, I, I'd love to turn everything into, into an option stream, but I'm not sure everybody would necessarily in, enjoy that. What's your take on oil prices after the decline? I think structurally we have a, a, a problem with oil prices. I, I don't see them coming going up. I think Russia will cut oil exports as we head into the winter because that's when they know they can get the biggest impact and make the most money. This is all about money, right? This is what it's all about. And so I just don't really see that. Yeah, a recession will tamper demand somewhat, but not sufficiently to really like fix this underlying problem that we have with, a, you know, if you remove, I think Russia exports something like 8% of the world's oil. If you remove 8% supply, you're... You, you would, might think your prices go up 8%. No, actually, they like triple or quadruple because no one else is making, making up the difference. So you then have an imbalance of just too much demand. And some people say, oh, no one's going to buy oil at 200. Well, yeah, they will because you need plastic, you need chemicals, you need fertilizers, you need to transport goods from A to B. All of this needs oil. The ships need oil, airplanes need oil, everything needs oil. So as... We are not as dependent on oil as we were in the 1970s because we've got, you know, we can burn coal and gas, but that's the same problem. Um, and, you know, nuclear is being switched off across Europe, which is obviously super helpful in this time. And, yeah, people are just going to have to buy it. And it's, co it's essentially causing a massive recession here in Europe, where I am at the moment. Like, you can just, you can, you can, you can smell it. Well, not in, not in Monaco, obviously, but, you know, not on the Côte d'Azur, but everywhere else you can, you can smell it. But the assassination of uh, Abbey effects uh, take effects today. A very sad, sad story. I, a really, real, real tragedy there. Um, the the former 
uh, Prime Minister of Japan got gunned down this morning. If you didn't see that, um, entirely unclear why uh, at this point. But he yeah, he 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 died of his his his, his wounds. Unfortunately, um, I don't think it'll have a real impact on on markets. To be honest with you, I, I you know he's no longer in office. It's just a just a human tragedy rather than anything else. It, it'll cause a little bit of uh, a wobble, I think, in Japanese. Um, financials, perhaps, but I don't think it'll have a, have a lasting impact here on on anything in the market. Uh, Mihoko, yeah, absolutely, a very, very, very sad news um, for 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 Japan and and, and of course everybody. Um, real, like, just not, you know. Uh, people get shot all the time, unfortunately, but it's it's still a very, very sad effect. So if you've just joined us, let's have a quick look at where we are with the QQQ. QQQ is at minus 1.4%. So it's really tanking here this morning. The um, If you look at the S&P, it's also not looking too, too, too green pre-market. Let's have a look at the NASDAQ. And whoa, that's red, isn't it? That's really quite red. Um, Tesla down 1.5%. Um, can we turn on the... Can we turn on the price? Ah, brilliant. Tesla at 7.33, Amazon at 1.16, Apple down to 1.46, Microsoft down 1.3%, Meta's down, like NVIDIA, all the big boys are basically down. The whole tech sector is down, especially. Why? Because there are too many jobs in the US. <laughs> as simple as that. The US economy is too strong after years of stimulus, years of free money, and 40% extra US dollars in circulation. It does seem to be that increasing the money supply still has a link with inflation, which is what we were taught at economics uh, at university, weren't we? And, and somehow they tried to make us believe that there wasn't a causation, but there really is. So we've got 72,000 more jobs created this month than we were expecting. Unemployment rate sticky, still at 3.6%. Participation rate dropped once again. Even the manufacturing sector has added jobs. The only slight sliver of good news here is that hourly earnings are growing only at 0.3% a month, which basically means the uh, US worker is getting screwed. And the government is, is, is just laying people off. That's literally the only piece of good news we have here, but it's, you know, 9,000 jobs versus 372,000. Um, it just does, it doesn't have really a real impact. So the Fed is not getting what it wants. So the Fed's going to vote with its feet. They're going to throw things. They're going to thump on the table. And they are going to ra raise rates by 0.75% uh, this month. Uh, in my expectation, I think we're also going to get 0.75% again in September, which would take rates to 3.25% and then likely beyond 35 and 3.75% by the year, year end. And, and are therefore very, very likely causing a recession just because the impact of interest rates is, is lags. Uh, traditional economic theory tells you it lags by 18 months. And therefore, by the time this full impact hits the real economy, uh, you know, we are, we are su suddenly deeply in a recession. So I think that's basically where we're heading. Is that bad news? No, it really isn't. Honestly, it's wonderful. Recessions are marvelous for investors. It just elongates this buying period where we can buy great companies at cheaper prices. Honestly, the longer this lasts, the happier I'll be, especially if full employment is there, because then there's really no downside, right? There really isn't any any problem with any of this for, for, for ordinary people. So what am I doing? Buying, buying, buying. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Just exciting. Just exciting. Just buy great, good companies. Buy great stocks. If you want to know what good companies are, use something like our stock tracker. Put all of your tickets in here. And then just simply go to the top, hit the update button. Where is it? There it is, update. And then uh, watch the core numbers of your businesses uh, roll in so you really understand, you know, what are the margins? Uh, what are the returns on equity? What are the debt ratios? What are the, 
What's the long-term you know, earnings per share growth and all that kind of stuff? This is what you need to understand. You need to know this data. So go to FelixSpencer.com/patreon. It's like 20 cents a day to get access to that cheat and, of course, a gazillion other marvelous things. Join us for the year. You get an extra month off as well. So that's what I'm doing. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm, I'm going to continue to sell options. Um, we just did, a, did three more trades yesterday. We're up 105% so far this year. That is literally six months and a week of, of, of trading, 170 very small trades, it takes me about an hour a week. It really isn't that complicated. You just need to understand the strategy and you need to really follow that system that I teach you and implement it. And once you do that, you will just make money in all markets. It's just really fairly simple, but I you know, appreciate not everybody wants to make, make money. So if you don't want to make money, don't sign up. If you do want to make money, you know where to go. FelixRenz.org slash options. Here it is. The coupon code is 100PC. That stands for 100%. We were 100% up at the beginning of the week. We've added 5% to it since. Coupon code is still the same though. 100PC. Uh, join us and um, let me see what any questions are here. What do you think about the 220 billion infrastructure stimulus? This is the Chinese stimulus. China is basically taking 2023 loans that they normally allow the local government to issue bonds and saying you should issue them in this year and you should accelerate your infrastructure spending. Now, the positive side with Chinese stimulus is that they tend to spend it on infrastructure like they are here. So it's just not just mailing checks out to everybody who then go and buy you know, TV number nine. So it's a little bit smarter expenditure provided you know, the money actually ends up where it's meant to end up and all that kind of thing. They've done a, they've done a pretty, pretty tough job on corruption the last 10 years. So it's getting a lot better. And what's the impact here? Well, raw materials went up, you know, concrete and steel and that kind of stuff, which makes sense. And you're also seeing a, a nice little rebound in a lot of Chinese stocks because, of course, it creates employment it creates jobs. It creates more money in the economy. And a lot of the infrastructure will, of course, also be EV infrastructure. So broadly speaking, it's a it's a relatively good move, I think, from a from an investor point of view. Uh, and they obviously need to do something because all the lockdowns, you know, sort of dampens your spirit, doesn't it? You're not going out and buying things. You're losing your jobs. And then you have the whole uh, property debt uh, problem at the same time, which they are also tackling, I actually think, reasonably well. Behind the scenes, you're seeing significant reductions in debt levels. They're still very high, but at least they're doing something about it. But it's still too early to tell to kind of call a, a win on that. Um, Joe, thank you very much. I appreciate your kind comments that uh, always do. John says, since the 75% hike has been priced in already, how else can the Fed get more aggressive? 100 point hikes in July. Well, I think the market basically hasn't priced in a 75% point hike in, in September. And I think that's really where they can surprise us. So in, in, um, we're all expecting to go to sort of 225 to 250. We're at 175 at the moment. So we could go to 225, so, so to, to, to 250. And then the market is expecting we're only going to go to 300, so only 0.5% in September. I think September is going to be another 0.75%. And that will then take us to 3.25% by the end of September. And that will therefore mean we're going to go likely higher than indicated by the Fed by the end of the year to about 3.75. And the Fed at the moment is indicating 3.4% on their dot plot. So I think we'll go somewhat higher to about 3.75% by year end. And the market hasn't quite priced that in. You know, the market is priced in sort of 3.5, really. That's what the market's priced in. So there is a slight surprise here to the upside, I, I would say, on interest rates. And of course, higher rates reduce stock prices, especially growth stock prices, which is why we're seeing what we're seeing this morning. If you look at the futures, it's bright red in crimson. Um, oil prices down just in touch because the recession likelihood is just that much higher with that happening. But the dollar is still going up. So it just still means the world's freaking out. Um, not sure why lumber prices went up. I wonder if that's a Chinese stimulus thing. I don't think they use very much lumber and building over there, but there we are. And yeah, if you look at the, this is the QQQ pre-market at the moment. It's pretty red, isn't it? I mean, there's really, is anything green down here? KHC, don't know what that is. 
um, XEL. Also, don't know what that is. That's pretty the, much the only thing. And even if you look at the, the S&P, it's also very, very red, with the exception of some banks. And you'd expect that because the banks with the highest number of deposits will make the most money from the higher interest rates, right? Because they don't pass them on, um, at least not fully. That's how they make money. So that's kind of what we're seeing is just that if you want to see all U.S. companies, it gets very, very, very small, but it gives you a nice sort of color image. Well, at least in a moment. Here we go. And you can see it's broadly red. I mean, the gray stuff is also mostly negative. It just isn't, isn't that, that heavily negative. So who's up? Shell, BP, you know, the oil companies. That's pretty much it. Everything else is, is pretty bearish except for a bit of finance. But this, if you look at this, it kind of tells you why you need to have a diversified portfolio, right? If you have a, if you have a bit of finance, at least something is going up today. If you don't, then everything else is going down. So it's why it's a good, it's a good thing to do to diversify across industries. I always highly recommend that. I also always teach that, of course. So let's have a look at pre-market then at our some of our favorite stocks. Upstart's really falling off the cliff. I think they had disappointing. Did they? Did, was that? Hang on. Let me see. I don't want to tell you the wrong thing here. Yeah, net loss revenue projections worse and shares drop in pre-market trading. Exactly. So there we are. Right then, chaps, thanks very much for tuning in. I highly appreciate it. Uh, I will, of course, be covering more later on. If you want to make more than 100% the next six months, I'm not promising that, by the way, but it's our target. We've done it the last six months. It'd be a reasonable expectation. And learn the process, learn the strategy. Go to felixfanserbox.com options. And thank you very much for tuning in. See you on the next one.